For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 707, welcome to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. How are you, Josh? Excellent, Dan, as usual. Thank you. Great. And uh, today, we're, tonight, we're going back to school with Joan Salat, head of school at Cooper Academy. Joshua, spit out your gum. Yes, or if I, have en if I don't have enough for everybody in the classroom. <laughs> uh, Joan, how are you tonight? I'm fine, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, nice of you to come by. Uh, so first of all, uh, you're celebrating your 25th anniversary uh, this year, which uh, is really interesting, uh, Cooper Academy in Kirkland. First of all, tell us a bit about the school, and um, how do you start a school? You were there from almost the beginning. Uh, how does one open up a school and, and make a go of it? Uh, well, Cooper Academy is a private co-educational preschool, elementary, and secondary school. Uh, we have our permit from the Ministry of Education. We don't have any funding from them. I also have a daycare permit. And uh, Cooper Academy started as the dream of uh, my partner, who passed away two years ago at the age of 75. She was a public school teacher, and uh, it was her goal to start a school that had more individual programs for each child. And uh, she was a, an elementary teacher, uh, and generally lower elementary, and so she decided to branch out on her own and found a school where there would be a program written for each child in the school. She received her daycare permit first, and uh, so she started with a four-year-old program. She opened in 1986 with 19 students, and then she moved them on the next year to kindergarten and then to grade one. I joined the school in 1988 as a parent. I put my son in the kindergarten program, and I really loved the school because it had um, a wonderful spirit about it, an excitement about learning, and my son was happy to go every day. Uh, the only problem was that the school was full. By that time, it was up to around 70 students, and the building was too small to take in any more students, and so um, Jan Produce Project was kind of dead in the egg because she couldn't take any more students, so she would just have to move that same group up. And so I went on a committee to uh, try to find another location for the school, and we searched around, but uh, surprisingly enough, people do not want a school. They seem to think that it'll uh, lead to uh, juvenile delinquents running around the yards and uh, destroying their homes. So uh, there's not a lot of uh, positive feeling for having a school uh, next to your property. And also, uh, not very many places are zoned for schools. And I did have business experience. Uh, my husband and I owned uh, 10,000 apartments over a number of years, so I, I did uh, learn quite a bit about business, although I was an educator. And I realized that it was just never going to work. And so I spoke with my husband about it, and it was actually his idea. We owned land in Kirkland. He was a builder, developer, and I had an educational background. So he said, why don't we build a school? And it came from as simple as a, an idea as that. And uh, so I met with um, the uh, my partner, Jan Perdue, and she agreed to go into partnership with me. And that's uh, what we did. We decided to build a school. Now, now you, you didn't run a business before. You Yes, you got into, the, you were involved in running a partnership or apartment buildings or being involved with that, but not running a school, running a business with that has to hire qualified teachers and make sure that the, the scheduling is all correct and make sure whatever government guidelines you have to follow. What what drove you into this direction? Is it was there something? Were you bored with something and you wanted to get into it? Like why did why did you drive yourself into this situation? Well, I had been a teacher in the United States. I am originally from um, Texas, and um, I had a wonderful high school career there. But in Quebec, I did not have my certification at that time, and I wasn't working. And so this was the perfect opportunity for me to combine uh, that love of education, but also put my business knowledge. And um, I did have uh, some administrative skills that I had used uh, with the apartments and to put all that into operation. And uh, combined with Jan, I was quite young at the time. I was in my early 30s. Um, and so my partner had was was an older uh, woman and had more of that experience. So we we put our uh, skills together and uh, were able to do that. And so I learned kind of as we went, as we grew, and uh, I would interview people, make sure of you know having the right type of people to hire. Uh, but I was also looking after the business aspects of it. 
where you now going into business with a partner is sometimes a little scary because you don't know exactly how they are or how they'll operate or how they how they'll deal with you and how you can coexist did you have any concerns did you uh, did you go into it eyes wide open did you talk about it did you say hey maybe we need to set some ground rules how, how much planning did you take going into this? I'd have to say that I was a complete neophyte in that area, and we really did very little planning. It was kind of, this is a great idea. We need a school. Let's go ahead with it. And I really didn't even know her very well. I had probably met her once or twice and probably in conversation with other parents, so I hadn't even had a personal conversation with her. So it was kind of a leap of faith. Uh, but we, uh, she was a risk taker, which is great. I'm a little bit more conservative, um, and it just ended up being a wonderful partnership. We loved each other. We, uh, she had certain strengths, and I had certain strengths, and we worked together. Um, sometimes we would have a little conflicts. Like I was really interested in high school, and she was more of an elementary person, and she thought oh, high school, you know, m larger students, more trouble. Um, but uh, in general, we, in spite of not thinking it through it worked out very well did you you were partners with her right up to the date that she passed away or was uh, she no we went into partnership um, at the beginning she had the school permits the daycare permit and already a brand name it was very small but um, it, she had already started all of that and I could bring uh, a building that um, we would own and um, the uh, business experience you know to expand and to market it and that type of thing and so um, that we went into 50 50 partnership and I think that we always felt that we had that it was a good deal <laughs> you, you didn't so 50 50 was just off the top of your head you didn't because you were coming in with land she was coming in with experience you just said hey let's go 50 50 that's it because I think that um, we were probably on the more educational side of let's be fair, fair, fair and do a 50-50. And uh, I also made her a 50-50 partner in the ownership of the building, which so many business people have asked me, why did you do that? But to me, it was she gave me her, you know, her half of her company and I was giving her half of everything that we had. So, uh, but um, two years before she died, um, uh, no, I'm sorry. Five years before she died, she decided that she had reached uh, 70 years old and she wanted to retire. And so she asked me, um, what would you like to do? I want to retire. Would you like to buy me out? Would you like to sell? And that is something that we hadn't really thought through before when we did our partnership. So that was a little bit awkward to work that out. So that would be an interesting story to hear because planning wasn't happening at the beginning, maybe a little bit more at the end. Let's learn from Joan a little bit uh, right after these, uh, these few words. Joan Salette, head of school at Cooper Academy. More with her on today's Entrepreneur in just a moment at 7.15. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.18, welcome back to today's Entrepreneur. Inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Dan Delmar along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller and our guest this evening, Joan Salette, head of school at Cooper Academy. And Josh, we're talking about the beginnings 25 years ago of Cooper Academy, how the partnership with Joan uh, and her, her partner at the time uh, was almost uh, very improvised, 50-50. They did it really quickly, but as time went on, things changed and you had to start planning a bit more. And, and entrepreneurs, you know, they entrepreneurs go by a lot of gut feeling, which is great as long as everything works out. And in this case, it worked out. When it doesn't work out, sometimes there's regret and maybe we should have planned a little bit better. But as we, as we jump back into the story with Joan and we hear that there was a little bit more forethought as to how her and her partner uh, decided to uh, to split apart, uh, I guess I, I, I look to Joan and say, how, you know, you started to say five years before she uh, she passed away. She said maybe it was time to to part ways. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how that happened and and how the process kind of worked. Uh, well, Jan had always said, "Oh, I'm going to die at my desk." That she'd always say, "Oh, I'm going to die at my desk. I love this." And then uh, I was actually a little surprised, even though she was 70, but she just was such a you know vital person. Um, I didn't expect her to come up with that, and she said, "You know, I think I'm ready to retire." 
and uh, she said what would you like to do with uh, with the business would you like to sell and I almost had an apoplectic fit because no I didn't want to sell I wanted to continue on and so uh, she said or you know would you like to buy me out so um, I said no of course I'd like to buy you out but we had to uh, we were so close but it was a little bit awkward I don't know I think we were um, just to sit down and then all of a sudden be just business 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 and uh, to try to um, we had grown so much as well to try to evaluate the growth and how much it, it could be worth and uh, so we um, we did negotiations we had our accountant in it but it was the accountant for both of us so that was a little hard oh, she didn't have her own and you had your own it was the same one for both it was of the same one for the company that we were and so it was just I don't know it was a little bit we were kind of going around and around and so finally um, what happened was that she her brother was a lawyer and he suggested that she have representation and we so that someone neutral could talk mm -hmm. and so it worked much better then we had a, a third neutral party and so we went back and forth and then came to a very amicable settlement so that worked out well but it was probably something that we should have planned or thought about before uh, before that that period so you find it tough to sort of uh, get into that business mode with someone who you were friends with I think that's really it and um, I was not a business person by training. I, I kind of fell into it. I'm really an educator, and she was an educator as well. In fact, she would tell me, uh, I really don't want to know. Ver like, if parents don't pay, don't tell me. I really don't even want to know. And at the financial meetings, she would say, she would just pop in and say, is everything okay? Great. And then she'd go. <laughs> so. <laughs> just the kind of partner you want to have. Oh, she was adorable. <laughs> in, in, in hindsight, would you have wanted to create the, an agreement, a, a shareholders agreement where you could try and foresee and deal with some of the issues instead of waiting afterwards and hoping that the right professionals give you the right direction? I think because it turned out well, I, I don't have any regrets about it, but I think it would be, if I would advise someone else, I would probably say it would be a more prudent thing to do that maybe it wouldn't always work out so well. <laughs> If you were to take on a partner today, would you put an agreement in place? I think I would. I think I would think it through all the way to a possible a possible uh, separation at some point, yes. And, and I think that's what entrepreneurs really have to kind of wrap their heads around is they just want to go and they want to do the business and they want to make the profit and they want to, uh, you know, the processes and, and the reality of the potential events that could happen, good, bad, or otherwise, don't always enter the picture. And uh, sometimes the, the surrounding people, whether it's a professional, whether it's a friend, whether it's a spouse, uh, certainly can, can probably help give that guidance. But it's something to always keep. The mind sometimes has to work where the heart, you know, doesn't, doesn't always want to venture. And it's, uh, it's not an easy lesson for entrepreneurs to learn sometimes. And it's a big heart business in a sense when you're teaching kids. So maybe after the break, Joan, we'll explore that a bit and how you can stay focused on business uh, when you're trying to be uh, a mother to hundreds of students. Uh, 723 on Today's Entrepreneur. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back to today's Entrepreneur. Our guest is Joan Sillette, head of school at Cooper Academy, a private school in Kirkland. And we're talking about, Josh, some of the business aspects going on here. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, Joan um, has to lead with her heart often. It's, it's, not, an, it's not an easy separation um, just like it is at, say, I don't know, a dependent or buying and selling, you know, profit motive. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But it's a real business. And even though there are students and kids around and your heart kind of wants to guide you, you've got to run your business. You've got to make sure that things are in the right place, the right time, scheduled right. Um, and there's a huge human resource side to, to that business. So I, I guess, Joan, uh, curious to know, on the human resource side, how do you, like, you know, what's your management style? How do you... Is it difficult to find your teachers and administrators? Tell us a little bit about that. When we were a great deal smaller, it was a little bit more difficult because um, we didn't have uh, the name that would draw and it didn't immediately mean something to people. And now that we've really established ourselves, uh, we have uh, a great reputation academically and also uh, with the well-being of the students. Uh, we have many students 
who have gone on to uh, Ivy League uh, schools or the best schools in Canada are out there. Um, I have that um, that reputation. But in the early years, it was people there. Cooper, are you the German school? Um, they they weren't really so sure. And so for someone to uh, risk the career in a school that wasn't so well known, it, it was a little bit more difficult. Um, it, in the last, I would say, 10 years, every year, it's it's uh, just have more and more and more applicants. I have a lovely connection with uh, McGill University. In fact, there was a, a job fair there today, and the applicants just kind of lining up, but we want to come to Cooper. Um, in the elementary school, um, there seem to be um, more students graduating, and so um, it is uh, somewhat easier to find an elementary teacher in the high school area, especially in uh, math and science and specific areas it's uh, sometimes more difficult uh, so I put ads in the paper I go through the universities there are uh, job sites that you can go on um, and I really do usually have quite a few candidates for a job uh, so I wouldn't say that it's it's difficult now but it hasn't always been that case and is the caliber of teacher the same today as it was before do you and when you when you interview them do you test them? Do you do background checks? Like, how in depth do you make sure that these people that are that are there in charge and dealing with safety and security and education of the students, how much effort do you put in making sure it's the right person? Um, we always do a background check. We do a police check. I also always Google them because I've learned that that you can find <laughs> out uh, many things uh, very quickly. Uh, we have a multiple interview process. And um, we always check the references. We do a personal call for the references. Um, if there are two or three, we'll call two or three. Um, we also like to have them sometimes come in and teach a class because some people can have a beautiful degree, but if you cannot handle uh, children, it's, it's another... Um, quality that you can't teach and it's commanding the attention uh, classroom management is is absolutely key and so sometimes I will have someone come in and actually teach a class and I can tell in an hour whether they're gonna work out or not so as this is as a test before you actually hire before them, they're hired yes and do you stay on do you monitor them either throughout the year or or evaluate them throughout the year? Uh, yes, when a new teacher is hired, uh, they have a three-month period in which they'll be evaluated twice, and then they'll have a formal sit-down at the end of that, and it's probationary up until that point, and then their contract is, um, uh, then they become permanent. But um, throughout the year, we are in the classrooms all the time. Um, we, the administrators will go around and evaluate the teachers on different lessons. We also invite them, we try to have a very open style so that if they're doing something interesting, come into the classroom uh, and see what we're doing. So we really have a very good idea on a daily basis of what each teacher is doing. So from uh, guns, drugs, and riots in Texas to uh, Cooper Academy in Kirkland, we'll talk about that transition with Joan Salette, head of school at Cooper, in just a moment at 7.30. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants, and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back to Today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Josh Miller of Fuller Landau, and our guest this evening is Joan Zellett, head of school at Cooper Academy. Uh, Joan is a native of Texas, and you taught in uh, Dallas, Houston, in some very, very tough public schools, uh, drugs, gangs, uh, all kinds of crazy stories that I want to I hear uh, a bit more about. Tell me about where you come from and about how you made the transition from the mean streets of Dallas and Houston to the mean streets of Kirkland. <laughs> when I graduated from university, there was the glut of English teachers. I had a master's in 18th century English literature, and uh, in the States at that time, uh, if you wanted a job, it was straight to the ghetto, and uh, so that's where I went. And I ended up um, being very successful there, and I did love my students, but it was almost being a social worker, 
first an English teacher was so far down the line. I actually had students in the upper levels of high school who were uh, basically illiterate. And um, so the principal would say, I want you to do Shakespeare. And I would say, yes, but they're illiterate. And he said, so rewrite it. And he didn't really care. He just wanted you to stay in your classroom and keep them quiet. And so I developed a lot of uh, remedial reading programs and um, things like that to uh, meet the needs of the students. But it was also a very violent environment. And what I found was that I had to meet those uh, social um, and family needs of the students first because they're um, they didn't eat, for instance, so I'd get them on the free breakfast, free lunch plan. They would come with gaping uh, cuts in their legs, and so I would get them tended to. I had a girl who told me that her sister had died and was on the sofa at home, and she didn't know what to do with her. And I arranged for her to, for someone to go to her house and to have a burial. And so it was just meeting their basic needs and then trying to teach afterwards. And uh, I think in my role as uh, head of school at Cooper, people will say, well, you never seem to get upset. And I say, well, these problems just seem to be very small compared to what I've dealt with in the past, and that's why. <laughs> so I would imagine, I, I mean, okay, uh, Kirkland is not exactly Dallas or, or Houston, but certainly safety and security in operating a school has got to be one of your number one concerns, and uh, certainly in operating a business with your whatever insurance you hold. So how, how do you deal with, uh, how did you approach the safety and security level when when operating the school? Well, I wanted to have a secure campus. We have six and a half acres, and uh, it is all fenced in, but, I mean, someone could slip over a fence or under a fence, something like that. And so what I did was I put a security system on all the buildings. Um, I have had uh, six different levels of construction there at the school. And so um, what I would do, would, I would put keypads on the door, and the children have the codes to the keypads, so they can come and go, but people from the outside would not. Um, we have limited access to the building so that you might must come in through a central location, visitor badges, and the doors are locked so you cannot come in uh, during any hours except um, when the students are coming in or leaving after school. Um, and that way, we also have a team of uh, men who walk around the campus um, doing uh, repairs and things, but also monitoring uh, anyone who can come or go. And uh, so we really feel that we have a very safe environment. In fact, I did receive a, uh, an award from Sun Youth for uh, coming up with a complete comprehensive safety plan for the, the campus, including um, if you would have someone who would come into to try to come into the school like a Dawson type of incident so we have an entire plan we practice shelter in place and I actually let the police stations come and practice in the school uh, with having someone loose in a school and they would hide in the library or hide in the stage behind the curtains and then uh, practice what what would occur and so I really feel that uh, we have explored all avenues and tried to make it as safe as possible for the children now this requires a lot of a lot of training for uh, your your staff and your and your teachers and all that how do you, do you how do you find it an ongoing process to make sure everybody is up to date with all the uh, issues and processes and Yes, I have a manual, and then we have a practice. Um, at the beginning of the year, we review it, and then we have to have um, practices, practice sessions during the year. Um, for instance, there are two different things. If if someone is in the building, you must stay in your classroom. Well, you might not know that. You might think, oh, let me run out. So we have to tell the students that you will stay in your classroom. Uh, and if there is this, and other than that, you would gather in a general place. What happens if you're in the hall? What happens if you're in the bathroom? So we have practices with the teachers, and then we have practice sessions with the students as well. Now, you're, you are a pri fully private school. Yes. Uh, no government subsidies? I have no subsidies for the elementary and the high school. I do have subsidies for the daycare, which is the four-year-old program. $7-a-day day daycare? $7-a-day day daycare, yes. So with, with no subsidies, uh, you have to manage your own funds. You have to make sure the revenues are right, the expenses are all there. Have do you have to meet do my you, ratios. You have to meet your ratios. Do you, how much planning do you do at the beginning beginning of each year? Um, I actually have to plan the year before because uh, education in Montreal is very odd. 
um, they people start having open houses for the next academic year. It used to be in February, then everyone became very competitive. It moved back to November, then October, and now some people have them in September. And uh, so you have to set all of your fees for the next academic year before you've even completed that year. And you don't know if the teacher salaries will be rising, if books will go up, if the government will add a new tax. I just got my municipal taxes. They went up $30,000. I don't know why. I'm looking into it. Um, there are certainly many unknowns and but I must set those fees in the previous September so I do a great deal of planning and I have little cushions um, but at the same time I'm trying to be very um, mindful of the parents because um, my parents are not old money and it, it does matter to them if I raise the fees several hundred dollars it matters to them so I'm trying to keep the fees in uh, the best possible range but also uh, meet all those ratios and uh, and the, have enough money to you know purchase everything and have the quality of education that I want. Are you, con are you conscious of your clientele in the sense that, uh, well, not that they're captive necessarily, but, I mean, it, it's different. I mean, because they can't just go somewhere else. It's, it's really heart-wrenching to, to yank a kid out of school. Are you conscious of the fact that they sort of, um, they, they need to stay within the system? And, and how do you, I guess, model your business after that type of clientele? Well, I have family plans for the tuition, but um, in the past few years, I've had many, many families who've experienced difficulty. I have uh, many people who own their own businesses, uh, people in the aerospace industry, I have people in the pharmaceutical industry, I have people in the garment industry, and uh, people who've had a great deal of uh, trade with uh, the United States. And so all of those have suffered heavily, heavily, heavily. And so what I try to do is I have um, uh, financial aid, um, for them, I have um, also academic and sports scholarships, but families that experience difficulty, I try to sit down with them and see uh, what what we can do to keep their children in Cooper and try to be uh, very mindful that uh, they could be experiencing temporary difficulty, but in a year or so they'll come out of it. And it's worked very well for me. Like people are very grateful, and they often are kind of entrepreneurial people who do come out of it and come out on the other side, and they're happy that the children were able to stay there. So you, you have a budget that you truly try and follow, but you also have to have your, your teachers, administrators, ensure that they are aware of the budget and not to go over. Is that? Is that difficult? Is, do they understand it? Is that something you try and impart with them constantly? Yes. Well, I find that teachers, um, if you tell them they have uh, $300 to spend, they won't spend 301 And if you tell them that you can't make long-distance phone calls, they will not make long-distance phone calls. They, they, they are wonderful in that way. But sometimes I don't think they understand um, that, you know, if we have the new textbooks well, all the others are scrap and that's you know hundreds of dollars for for that and so or just even choosing a new novel I've got a book room full of novels and then they want new novels so sometimes I have to hold them back a little bit in that but sometimes it's because they, they didn't really realize it but I always try to make the decisions I don't make the decisions as a business person first it's what is good for the academic program and then I try to use the business aspect to uh, to get what I need for it, but um, I won't make a decision that's bad for the education if it's good for the economic side. <laughs> it's a huge balancing act that you that you constantly undergo. It's I you know and as I as I listen to Joan and her story, it's okay, we have to balance the needs of the students, the needs of the customers, if you will, certainly, but we have to balance the needs of, of what's good for them and almost deciding for them what's in advance what's good. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a balancing act from an administrative standpoint, uh, a, human, a human interest and a, and a heartfelt standpoint, and it's something that's uh, not easily done and, and an entrepreneur uh, that has to carry both head and heart every day in every decision making is, uh, is certainly tremendous. Thank you very much, Joan, for, for being part of this. So many factors at play, Josh. And in a second, uh, Joan is, of course, American coming to Canada. Now we're going to go back to the States and talk with uh, our tax partner at Fuller Landau, Ernie Furt, about buying property in the States and some of the challenges that lie uh, within that exercise. It's 7.45 on CJ80. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 748, welcome back to today's entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. Our guests this evening, Joan Salette, head of school at Cooper Academy. We'll hear Joan's uh, words of wisdom 
for today's entrepreneur in a few minutes. But first, uh, we turn to Ernie Furt, tax partner at Fuller Landau. And Ernie, we're going to talk about buying property in the States. We know it, uh, well, it depends on who you ask. I mean, Josh, it could be a, a, an iffy time. It could be a wonderful opportunity to, to buy property down south. You know, we in talking with so many entrepreneurs over the last couple of years and, and in the little breaks in between, you know, there's always the successful ones that, you know, have their property or want to buy their property south of the border. Uh, so figure, hey, you know, let's let's get into that topic because there's so many challenges and pitfalls and things to know. So, uh, Ernie, let's right into it. If somebody wants to go and buy a property in the States, wherever it may be, and Florida is probably the most popular uh, for, for Quebecers, but what are the, some of the areas, pitfalls, challenges, items that they should know before heading into purchasing a U.S. property? One of the biggest pitfalls is U.S. estate tax. They have to realize that if they have a U.S. property, that potentially as a Canadian, that they're going to be subject to U.S. estate tax, and they have to be able to mitigate that because U.S. estate tax is not is not based on the differential between the, what you paid for it and what it's worth, but it's just based on what uh, on what it's worth today. So tomorrow, if you happen to go out there and get hit by a bus and you just bought a million dollar condo, you have a nice U.S. estate tax bill. And wh what if you rent out that property? If you rent out that property, there's a lot of things that you have to know. You have to get a U.S. ID number. You have to file a U.S. income tax return. And that U.S. income or loss goes on your Canadian return as well. So if you're a Canadian resident owning U.S. rental property, you got to file in both countries. And no, you're not paying tax twice. You're getting a foreign tax credit in Canada on what you pay in the United States. So when, when people are going in, coming back to your first point of, you know, the U.S. estate tax, are there areas or, or what have you seen that people have done to try and mitigate some of that U.S. estate tax? Well, these days, some of the properties are really cheap, so they may not even be subject to U.S. estate tax because effectively you're looking at $60,000 uh, in, $60, in terms of an exemption for a uh, non-resident, non-citizen in the United States. Now, that can increase uh, based on your assets, but it's, let, let's not have that discussion. But what people do to mitigate the potential of U.S. estate tax is they can buy insurance. That's one thing to do. They can look at getting a special type of mortgage called a non-recourse mortgage. And uh, they can make sure that their taxes in the United States balance their taxes in Canada so we get an offset on the credits from the U.S. estate tax to Canadian tax on death. You know, non-recourse mortgage, uh, you know, and I, I've seen a few instances where that's been one of the strategies to try and minimize or eliminate this U.S. estate tax, but with the banks nowadays, certainly in the States, it's becoming that much harder to get. So while I agree, Ernie, that it's a good strategy, before people are going into it and say, hey, that's one way I'm going to reduce it, you really have to, make, you know, know that the banking system in the states is not quite like it's here in Canada so they're loaning a little bit less they're looking at at, at mortgage uh, mortgaging on values that are much much lower um, so that that's another when you're when you're looking to buy into the states and you're looking for for getting funds to 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 be lent to you to buy that property the values that these brokers or these valuators are giving properties are so low so are are there are there other ways that maybe that people can kind of look and mitigate or, or prolong, push off that U.S. estate tax? Well, they could gift the property to a spouse uh, in, uh, in a situation, you know, not necessarily gift it, but bequeath it in, in a will. That's one way of doing that. Uh, they can do that to the, they can bequest it to their children, but they're going to be paying that U.S. estate tax. And there's different trusts and other vehicles that, that you could use to, to keep that going forever. Some people want to put it in the corporation. That's not necessarily a good idea. All right. We'll talk more about bequeathing in a moment on today's Entrepreneur. And you'll also hear uh, Joan Slett's words of wisdom for today's Entrepreneur. That's coming up in a moment at 7.53 on a CJAD. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, Chartered Accountants, and Business Advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 
Welcome back. Remaining moments with our guests, uh, Joan Sillette, head of school at Cooper Academy, and Ernie Furt, tax partner at Full Orlando. And Ernie, uh, if uh, we, we keep hearing about these condos in Florida, you know, $30,000, the price of a car. If Dan Delmar wants to buy a condo in Florida, does Dan Delmar personally buy the condo, or does Dan Delmar, Inc., buy the condo in Florida? If it's Dan Delmar buying the condo for his own personal use, Dan Delmar should buy the condo or set up some type of trust vehicle for Dan Delmar to buy the condo. But if Dan Delmar wants to be on today's entrepreneur in 10 years and he wants to have <laughs> Uh, and he wants to, to, to have a real estate business in the States, then we have to start thinking of other vehicles. And we have to look at all the vehicles that are available, which, are, which can be a Canadian corporation, can be a U.S. corporation, uh, it could be a trust, it could be a limited partnership. And what you have to do is you have to look at all the tax angles and then look at the estate tax angles and see what's best. And some people who have money today who want to invest in U.S. real property don't necessarily have it personally. They have it inside their corporation. And if they're going to invest in real property in the States, they say, well, you know, either I take it out you know, via salary, via dividend, and invest, or alternatively, maybe my corporation should invest. But always look at all your angles and uh, discuss it with a competent accountant, such as Josh or myself, and we'll help you out. Is there one way that tends to be better or worse than the other? That really depends. Uh, I like the personal method, but the personal method comes with the state tax so you have to be able to mitigate that problem or that problem has to, shouldn't matter to you at the end of the day you don't want the tax tail to wag the business dog you just want to make sure that what you do is smart and you covered all your bases and when it comes to selling it down the road does it matter if it's corporate or if it's personal no it's still subject to taxation in the states it just depends how you're going to do it and there's different forms to file just like there are in canada when you when you sell a property to certain withholding tax that that's there and so certain states will levy a withholding tax as well and some will levy the, the tax on the gross of the the gross sale proceeds of the property and then you're going to have to file tax returns to get to get back based on uh, on the net proceeds so bottom line is don't shoot first and ask questions later ask the questions first make sure you're going down the right path uh, because there's so many different possibilities and then you can make the right decision. Absolutely. That sounds great. Thanks very much, Ernie. Well, Joan, as we uh, come to the end of the show, uh, and with all your 25 years plus experience in the education system, can you offer a piece of advice to today's entrepreneur? I would say that you must be passionate about what you're doing. You have to believe in it because you will have to go before bankers and lenders, and you will have to sell it to them. And you have to know your business thoroughly but I think that it would be your passion, your enthusiasm that would make them believe that you can make it. You will do this, whatever you've promised to do. And I care so much about education. I care about my students. And I think I was able to convey that. And that has contributed to our, our success. Thank you. And Dan, th the takeaway I get, and, and certainly passion for what you do, comes out of it. And it comes out a lot in our stories. But I think what, what didn't come out directly, but very subtly, but very clearly, is Joan's knowledge of her product and service. She knows exactly what that school can offer. She knows exactly what it should offer. She knows her students. She knows what her students need. She knows what the educators should want. And the knowledge of that product and service is absolutely evident. And an entrepreneur, for them to not know, is absolutely detrimental and can be destructive. So to know your product backwards and forwards so that if you're sitting in front of a customer, if you're sitting in front of a supplier, if you're sitting in front of a banker, you can spew it out without having to bat an eyelash, without having to think twice. And that is the that demonstrates what a true entrepreneur really is all about and how successful they'll be. And uh, Joan demonstrates balance too, the balance between you know the business end and the passion end, and uh, no more. That's n no more evident than with uh, certainly with Cooper Academy. Uh, Joan Salette, head of school at Cooper. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Ernie Furt, a tax partner at Full Orlando. Ernie, I'm going to go uh, condo shopping soon, and I'll take you along with me. Okay. Perfect. Dan got uh, extra money. <laughs> Josh is bankrolling me. Uh, Josh Miller, back next week, uh, 7 p.m. on Monday nights here on CJAD. You can reach Fuller Landau during business hours at 514-875-2865 or visit www.flmontreal.com. Have a good night.